Hey everyone, I'm Sierra Combs and I'm the Women's Director here at the River Church. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way to do that is to text River Connect one word, to 97000, or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope that you enjoyed the message today. Good morning, River Church. How are we? Very good. It's great to see you all this morning. Pat said, if it rains, it's not going to rain, Pat. We're going to have our picnic. It's going to be great. I looked at the, the Doppler, and it says no rain at all. And I really trust that thing, always. I do. I really trust it. Here's what I know. If God wants this to rain, it, it's going to rain. And if not, it's not. So I'm pretty happy. And I hope you will come join us. It's under a pavilion, and we're going to have some lunch, and we'd love to, to hang out with you and see you uh, today over at Hess Hathaway. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn to the book of Proverbs. I'm just kidding. We're done with Proverbs, eh? <laughs> if you've been around, we've been in Proverbs for like four months. And if you're a little uh, ADD like me, you're like, I'm ready for a new book. Let's go. Let's go somewhere else. So Ephesians chapter number four. Ephesians chapter number four. Um, Hey, let's pray and we'll um, we'll go to the word. Lord God, we love you. Thank you for our church. I pray this morning, Lord, may you open up our ears and our hearts to hear from you. Lord God, as um, you called me to preach your word, Lord, may um, I speak truth and speak the word that you've given. And Lord God, I pray that uh, it moves and for some it encourages, for some it convicts. May, Lord, we follow you. So I pray that you'd bless in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So Ephesians chapter number four, we're starting a a, a new series uh, dealing with the church. That um, what is the church and who are we as the church? And I'm wearing this Pistons jersey, not because I love the Detroit Pistons. Uh, I'm wearing it just to, just to kind of give you a reminder, like this is the jersey. This is like to be a Piston, this is this, you know, being part of the team. And this morning I want to talk to you about what does it mean to be a part of the team as, as the church? That the Bible says that if we know Christ is our Savior, we are a part of the church. Now, the church really is one. We're part of the big church. Like if we know Christ is our Savior, um, if we truly follow Jesus, we're, we're a part of the big church. And I know some churches out there think everybody else is the enemy. They're wrong. If we know, if we know Christ, we're the church together. But there's also this thing called the local church As you read the New Testament and as you read through books, uh, the epistles like Ephesians and Galatians and Thessalonians, you'll find that these letters were written to that local church, the local church in Ephesus. And so we see the very importance that the Bible tells us about being a part of the local church, to to be a part of that team. So in Ephesians chapter 4, reading in verse 15, the Bible says this. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. For from the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. As you read this part of Ephesians, this letter to the local church, Paul, through the Spirit, is telling the local church, this is what the body of Christ looks like. And here it even explains, it it goes into verse 16, it talks about the whole body, join, held together, every joint. This is speaking of the body of Christ. Now, if you've been around the church, what I call a churchy a while, when I say the body of Christ, you ought to automatically have a thought. But if you're new, maybe you're, you're new to this Christianity thing, maybe you're new in your faith, when you hear the body of Christ, you may think something different. You may think, when I say the body of Christ, you're thinking, are they talking about Jesus, maybe his body that was hung on the cross? When, when the New Testament talks about the body of Christ, 
It is referring to the church as a whole. It is using the illustration that as a body works together, hands, feet, toes, knees, hips, all of that, uh, as that works together, so are we, as we are on the team of the church, we're called to work together. So verses like 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 27 says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Ephesians 3, 6 talks about the, the, the mystery of how now the Gentiles and the Jews, they're all the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ. And here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, it lays out, it says, hey, if you know Christ, you're part of the team. You're part of the team, and we're supposed to work together in the same body. It's this picture for us. It's this picture of being a team. Some of you are, are, are better at this. Some of you are better at this. But if the body of Christ, if those who are on the team of Christ will work together, here's what the Bible says. It says, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. There are many, 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 many books on how to grow a church. And we're not just talking about numerical. How does the church grow? But you come here in the Bible, God's holy word, and it says, here's how the church is going to be built up. It's when the church comes together as the team using the gifts they're called to use. And here the Bible says, like, you're going to affect each other. You may get this, the eight o'clock really got this. I said, hey, you know how sometimes when your knee's not working right, it doesn't just affect the knee? When your knee doesn't work right, your hip hurts along with your back, and for some reason it's hurting your shoulder because your knee hurts. You ever have that problem? Yes. All right, you guys get this too. Your back hurts, right? And it all extends all the way down to your big toe. For some reason my back is hurting, but my big toe hurts because of my back. Well, the Bible here is saying the same thing, but it's also positive. When your knee's working right, man, it sure helps the hips. And the Bible says if the church will be the team that we're called to be, if the church will come together and realize that we're called to work together and to serve together, it is amazing the blessing that you can be to each other. It's amazing how if, if this is working right, it, it affects the whole, the whole thing. So this morning, I want to talk to you about what it looks like for a team, the church, to work together. So let's read this whole passage, Ephesians chapter 4. Let's start in verse 11. Before I do that, I, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. There, there's a paraphrase of Ephesians 4. I, it was helpful for me. It says this, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So here in Ephesians verse 11, it speaks to that body of Christ, to the church, to that team. It says, and he gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers here it's talking about the, the gifts that God has given. And, and I was reading one commentary. It talked about how there were, there were the apostles, the disciples, right? And the prophets and, and, and even the evangelists. And those really are, they were starting the church and they were the kind of the roamers. But when you get to, there's the shepherd or, or in other words, the pastor. And we see in the Bible that's interchangeable. Pastor, shepherd, teachers, it focuses on the local church, the pastors and teachers. And again, as I was studying, I'm no Greek scholar, but those who do know Greek say that the, the translation here, when it uses pastors and shepherds and teachers, those words are really linked together in the Greek. So it's saying like the pastor is called to, to shepherd the flock and to teach. And not all teachers in the church are pastors, but there is this amazing connection. So here we see the, some of the gifts in the church. In verse 12, it says that, the, that he gave us these, the pastors and the teachers, verse 12, to equip the saints. And just so we don't get lost, the saints are anyone who has accepted the righteousness of Jesus Christ upon them. The saints are holy not because of their works, but because of trusting Christ as their Savior. 
It says to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And then that lands us back to verse 15 and 16 that talks about that equipping, that building, and that working. Now, as I was studying this this passage here, um, I came across... I guess as I was studying and looked at verse 11, sometimes there's just the light bulb goes off or I feel like the Lord just reveals to me and I really felt like God pointed me to Ephesians 4 this week and so I'm studying it, but there was a point where I was like, okay, like the light, like I see, I see what you're saying here in the passage and it, if you look at verse 12, verse 12 uses these, to me, these three big words that stuck out to me, to equip for the work And for building. So I saw those words that that the church and the pastors and the teachers are called to equip the saints, those part of the team. They're to equip them for the work of the ministry to, to build the church. But when I looked at verse 16, what was amazing, and if you guys throw 16 up there, is that the same words used in 12 are the same words in 16. And a little side note, if the Bible repeats itself, Grab onto it. Many times the Bible is repeating itself. It's showing, hey, I want you to see this. Verse 16 says this, that they're joined and held together by every joint with which it is, there's this word again, equipped. When each part is, there's this word again, working properly, it makes the body grow so that it, here's this word again, builds itself up in love. And I believe here in Ephesians, it is showing what the team, the team of the church should look like. And and to be honest, what what a good team should look like. And I want to be a good team for the Lord. I want to be a team that is striving to do good things for the Lord, to honor him. And so this morning, I want to show you these things. And the first one is this team, the church team. We must be equipped. Over and over it says, hey, if you're on this team, you you must be equipped. And this word equipped, it's pointing to this maturing. It's pointing to growing in the things of the Lord. And when you get to verse 13, it talks about growing in the knowledge of God. It talks about growing in the standards of Christ. And almost every week, well, I would say every week that I preach, I, I bounce sermons off of people. And one person I bounce my sermon off of every single week is my wife. And I'll call her, and sometimes I'm super excited. Sometimes I'll call and be like, all right, this is what I think God has, and I'm super pumped on, I want to tell you all about this. And my wife is very even keel, so she doesn't like, she's not this like I am. Uh, But so she listens, and and she helps me, and, and sometimes I call her, and I'm like, slamming my head on a wall. I'm like, I can't figure it out, honey. I don't know what the Lord wants to pre. I, I can't. And, and so working through that. But this week I called her and I said, hon, this is, this is what I'm seeing, that, that the church, the team, were called to be equipped and to do God's work and, and then watch God do the building. And, and so we started talking through this and she said, you know, I've, I've been reading this book about maturity. And said, she said, the author just points right to this thing of being equipped and he uses first John and she started to take me through this and I was like, oh, this is great. I'm stealing all of this. And uh, so I'll give credit to the author, but, but he pointed this out in first John. And so side note, if you don't like this, you blame it on my wife. Okay. Uh, so in first John, first John chapter two, the Bible lays out these steps of maturity the, the Bible lays out being equipped. What is it? Because sometimes we say be equipped, and it's like, what does that practically look? What, what does that mean for me? And in 1 John, it explains it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. 
The writer says, I'm writing to you, little children. And what's interesting, he uses three stages of life, three stages of maturity, three stages of growing. He says, I'm writing you to, to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And then it repeats again. I am writing to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. And I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. So reading this, honestly, this passage, I've been confused. I'm like, God, well, are, are you just speaking to children or young adults? Are you speaking to, to, to those who are grown? And as I studied, and my wife helped me see this, along with this author, is that he's pointing to stages of maturity. He's pointing to stages of growing. He's pointing to, says this, little children. What does he say about the little children? You are, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. And then at the end of 13, he says, I write to you, children, because you know the Father. He's talking to those who are on the team. He's talking to those, and it's not about age at all. It's about this maturity. And he's saying, hey, those who are children of God, you're young. But are all the children of God? No. He says, those who are children of God, who is that? Those who know the Father and those whose sins are forgiven. He's pointing to this level of maturity, saying, hey, you know who's on the team? Those of you who have accepted Christ as your Savior. Those of you who have, have accepted Christ and you've trusted Christ, you're as a child. And we know children... Um, they're a little messy, aren't they? Children, they, Hughes says this, have you noticed how little children are ruled by emotions? Not their understanding. They get easily excited. Here's a lollipop. Yeah! Sorry, that's not in the quote. I just had that. They're easily frightened. You turn off the light. They're easily distracted. New Christians need the fellowship and care of more mature believers to help them grow spiritually. So here the writer is going, hey, there are some of you who are young in your faith and it's wonderful. I'm so excited here, listen, that we have a church where there are people who have come to know Christ recently. They are young in their faith. It is wonderful. It's fantastic. But the writer is saying, hey, there are some of you who are new. You think about a child, what's one of the first words that comes out of their mouth? right? Dada. They, they know the Father, right? They know salvation, but we can't stop there. So then it goes on to young people, young men. What does it say about them? It shows this next level of maturity. It says this, 14, I write to you young men because you are strong, well, what makes them strong? The word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. It really is this next step of knowing God's truth. And when you know God's truth and you're growing it, you start to apply that to your life, what happens? You can overcome the evil one. It's fantastic watching this happen in people's lives. You see somebody go, man, the mess of sin they're in, there's no way to get out of that until the Lord comes along. And because of his goodness and his grace and his strength, what's he do? Pulls them right out of it. Saves them. And so hear that level of going, you who are youth, you are overcoming the sin. You're not living in the bondage of sin. You don't have to stay there. And somebody may need to hear that today. You know Christ. You don't have to stay in that bondage. The God will give you the strength to overcome that. And hear that kind of that next step of being equipped. Where does it come from? Knowing the word of God. So my car this week, and for some reason I had a news radio station on. 
And they were telling of one of the wonderful court cases going on in our state. And I just remember a, 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 this lawyer came on and she said something like this, said, we know in our hearts and our minds, they tell us what is right and what is wrong. And so I kind of vomited in my mouth. Because my mind and my heart don't know what's right. Only through the word and the truth of God. Amen. That is what leads us to what is right and what is wrong. It is when we seek God's truth. We don't know the truth without God. And as we seek the Lord, he's the one that gives us the ability to know what's right and wrong and to overcome those things. And then it takes you kind of that third level. It talks about the father of being an adult. It says, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. And if you've been reading along with us, you may say, but pastor, it said the child knew the father. So what's the difference between the child knowing the father and an adult? Like, isn't that the same thing? No, it's not. See, even when in Ephesians, back in Ephesians 4, it says clearly, it says, it says, of the knowledge, in verse 13, of the Son of God to a mature manhood. This is pointing to someone who's being equipped by knowing God personally more and more. It's someone, and when you look at the Greek in the text here, it talks about this, this deep knowledge, this full and accurate knowledge. And those of us who know Christ we can know Christ more than the, just the first day we come to know him. We can grow in knowing the fullness of God. And that's why the Bible is so incredible because when you read it, I think sometimes we read the Bible and go, okay, God, tell me what to do and not to do today. And I think sometimes God goes, just read the Bible and hear who I am. Because the most important thing is you need to know who I am. I am the one who'll change your life. Know my love. Know my goodness. Know my truth. That's what will change us. That's what will change our team. Amen. That's why Colossians 1, 9, and 10 says, And so from this day we heard it. Paul says, We have not ceased to pray for you. To pray for what? Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. He wraps up verse 10. He says, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is how we're equipped, church, that we need to grow in him. As your pastor, um, many times I'll get an email, a text, a phone call, just asking for prayer from somebody. Something happened and we live in a broken world and these broken bodies and sin destroying things and so many times which I'm glad you do you say pastor can you pray we'll put you on the prayer list and to be honest with you there are many times I don't know what to pray I don't know what to pray and I'll tell you many times I come right back to this and I just pray God I pray that whatever whoever's in this situation whatever this place I pray that they will truly know you that in this storm, what's ever going on, that they will know the true God. As I was talking through this with my wife, I said, you know, this is something that we pray for our son. We pray for our son. What do we pray for our son? One, that he'd be a little child of the Lord. That he would accept the salvation of the Lord. But I'm not done there. I want so much more. It's not, God, keep Silas safe. Hope he's saved. Good, I'm good to go. No, there's so much more. And so to pray, God, I pray he knows you. But God, I pray he grows to be a young man who what? Overcomes sin. Who does not live under the bondage of sin, but because of your word and your truth, he overcomes sin. I'm not done there yet. God, I pray that he will know you. Not just church, programs, activities. No, no. That he will know you, God. Church, I believe this is something we need to be praying for our church. You ask, well, how do I pray for the church? Pray this. 
Pray we'll have little children in the church. And I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about little children in the Lord. Too many people think age is what gives you maturity in the Lord. It doesn't. There are plenty of 80-year-olds who've been saved a long time and they don't have maturity in the Lord. It's not age. But I pray we have a church full of young believers. And here's the thing about young believers. They're messy, right? They make a mess. It's wonderful. They ask you the crazy question. You growth community leader, you got a new, new believer and they ask you a question like, oh man, I don't want to answer that. It's wonderful. They fall down. They get back up. They're loud. They don't know what to do here. They're, 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 they're learning. It is so wonderful. And I pray that I'm always a part of church where people are continually coming to know Christ and young and growing in their faith. Let's pray it for our church, huh? But here's the thing. We don't want them to stay a rookie. We don't want them to stay making rookie mistakes. We want them to grow. And some of you need to be honest with yourself. You've been saved for a long time, but you stayed at this level. You haven't grown in knowing God's goodness for you. You haven't grown in, in, in making those strides to grow in the word and to grow in his truth and to overcome that sin and to get to a place where you hate sin. Church, may we pray this, that we'll have young people growing in the faith. We'll have people maturing. And what? Knowing the Lord. This is what it means to be equipped. And it goes back to Ephesians in verse 14. It says it like this, so that we know, may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every single doctrine, by cunning, human cunning and craftiness and deceitfulness. What does that mean? You see some young believers. They can fall for things. They fall for the, the new gimmick pastor out there, the newest book out there, and, and getting them grounded in God's word to grow in him. So that leads me to the second part of this team. We must be a team that's being equipped, but we must be a team that's what? Working for the Lord. Verse 16, verse 12 point to this, to equip the saints for what? The work of the ministry. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are the Lord's workmanship, created unto what? Good works. If you got saved so that you could get retired, you're missing what God's called you to do. God's called us to these amazing works. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says it like this, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 1 Peter 4, 10, each of you has received a gift Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very gift. We all have different gifts. We're to work for the Lord. There's a picture that has helped me this week. It's a picture of this, that we who know the Lord, who are part of Christ's team, we have to move from having a bib to having an apron. When you think about this, a child, he has a bib. Why? Feed me food, which is great, right? You're a child, I, I want to be fed, which is wonderful. But as we grow in the Lord, we move from the bib to the apron. We, mib, we move from all about me, and we move to help feeding others. It becomes this this purpose to go, man, I, I got to help feed others. So we move from the bib to the apron. Every year, my family goes with uh, Roy's family and a couple other families. We go to the other side of the state. We stay in this house and um, just have a, a week vacation together with our families. It's a wonderful time. And one of the families that comes, um, the man, he, he loves to cook. So on vacation, maybe you're different than me. I don't like to get up at like 6.30 a.m. on vacation. Maybe you do. That's just not. 
And so I'll get up, you know, eight o'clock and, and every time I get up, almost every single morning, he's in the kitchen and he's been there since like 6.30 and every year he's making something new, something new. He brings his pizza oven and so sometimes he's up at 6.30 like just preparing the dough, whatever, I don't know what this is, but he's preparing the dough. This year, his thing was, I'm gonna, he's going to make meatballs. And so on Monday, he made meatballs. And Tuesday, he made more meatballs. And each one was like different. And he would prepare different spices. And every day, he would just prepare a meal. Now, the thing about being an apron, he would prepare that. And he was still eating. We understand. We, we never get done eating God's word, growing in God's word. But he moved to, and his joy was, he couldn't wait for somebody else to taste that food. He couldn't wait for it. When do we as a church, we grow, we're part of this team that some of us got to go, man, I so want somebody to taste the amazing goodness of God. And you put on the apron and we, we help feed other people. We help love other people. Ephesians 4 says it like this. It says, rather speaking the truth in love. And here where it says speaking the truth in love. Our English struggles to, to make the, transition, the translation from Greek. So again, I told you I'm not a Greek scholar, but those who know Greek say the word here for truth and love, it, when it's translating, the literal meaning should be truthing. It's truthing the word in love. What does that mean? It's, it's living out that truth and what we do. It's truthing. And we as the church, we have something to give people. It's the amazing truth of Jesus. And God says, hey, you, this is what the team should look like. They're being equipped, and then they're working to tell people about Jesus, working to help feed people so they can grow. I also love the picture of an apron. Why? Because if you're a part of the church, you're going to get messy. It's just how it is. We are all broken, fallen, non-perfect people. Every single one of you. Me too. And there are messy times sometimes. But as we're part of the church, part of this team, we move to be an inn. When it's clean and wonderful and sometimes when it's messy. To truth, truthing in love. As I was working through this sermon, I thought it was interesting the, the parallels of a sports team and the church, and specifically when it comes to um, those on a sports team who aren't playing. Like you think about the NFL, and, and there's some guys in the NFL, they're not, they're not practicing right now, they're not playing right now. Why? Well, they're on some kind of list. The list helped me. Some are on the list because they're on the hurt list, right? Some NFL players aren't playing because they're hurt. They're on the IR, they're injured, they're hurt. Some of you are not participating on the team because you're hurt right now. Somehow the church has hurt you. Can I challenge you? I believe God's an amazing healer, but can I tell you something? Don't stay hurt. That God says, hey, I am showing you how you can be healed. I'm showing you to take steps. But what many people do in the church, they go, the church hurt me, so I'm done. And you stay on the hurt list the rest of your life. And you miss being out on what God's called you to do. And there are those on football teams or basketball teams. They're on the personal leave list. Something has happened in another part of their life, and so they've got to leave. Family, job, vacation, money, whatever. And to shoot straight with you, I think there are many people who are saying, God, I don't have time for the local church right now. I'm taking my personal leave. And they've taken, they've said, well, I, I've got family, I've got a job, I got this. And they make all the excuses to go, hey, I, I just, this, 
and they leave the team. Now, are those things important? Yes. But if those things are taking you away from God's, from being on the team of the church, I would challenge you, you need to re-look at that and to see, do I have things where God wants them to be? There are those on the pub list. That's the physically unable to perform. Some of you in here wish you could serve like you used to. There are things going on in your life. Can I tell you as a pastor, there are so many ways you can serve. There are just the, you can serve in Awana, youth, like there are so many ways, right? There are so many ways, many amazing ways to serve the Lord. One of the most amazing things I've seen in our church in the last couple of years is to hear people praying for the church and praying for the staff and praying that God would lead. It is amazing. And I don't want every, some of you, there, there's some of you listening online, you, you can't get here. I get it. You still can have ministry. You still can serve the Lord. And whether that's praying, and don't put that lightly because that's one of the best ones. But I know God gives us different gifts in different parts of our lives. And I don't want you to be discouraged in that. Lastly, with, with sports, I put that some people have asked for a trade. Some people feel they're not valuable, feel they don't fit, feel that the coach isn't put them where they should be put, feel like they don't have the right plays, they don't have the right programs, they don't have the right... In- I believe the church is so important. And so the splitting of the church and for us to get mad, for the team to bicker is what the evil one wants. So realizing how important the church is. It's about being equipped. It's about serving the Lord, right? When each part of you working is working properly, it makes the body grow. The last thing is the exciting part of watching God build his church because it's his. And we watch God build his church. And that doesn't, that, the building is in many different ways, right? That's people, that's maturity, that's love. But we watch God build his church. One last quote, a man named Paul Tripp, he said this. Your life is much bigger than a good job an understanding spouse, and non-delinquent kids. It is bigger than beautiful gardens, nice vacations, and fashionable clothes. In reality, you are part of something immense, something that began before you were born and will continue after. God is reaching fallen humanity, transporting transporting them into his kingdom and progressively changing them into his likeness. And he wants you to be a part of it. That's why today is about join the team. To be a part of it. At the end of this gathering, we'll have workers in the back. I challenge you. See how God wants you to join the team. It may be in an uncomfortable ministry you've never been a part of. I challenge you to do it. Fill out the card, hear the information. God says the church, we're to be equipped, we're to work, and we watch him build. That's the team I want to be a part of. Will you stand with me, please? pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Lord God, may you challenge us. May we be the church you've called us to be. Leave this morning, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name.